Continuing our conversation here on HBCU Digest Radio with leaders from the Atlanta University Center uh, on today's announcement of the extension of online learning through the fall semester. Uh, we are privileged to be joined by another friend of the show, my dear brother, uh, Dr. George T. French, the president of Clark Atlanta University. Um, and Doc, uh, it, it, we were just saying before we got on air, this thing changes and moves every day. But can you for as much as you can in, in, in sharing how you work with your constituents, your board, your faculty, students, alumni, how does Clark Atlanta reach a decision like this? And more importantly, how do you work with the AUC consortium to say, you know what, we got shared space and shared interests. Here's how we're doing it. And here's how we put it all together. Well, well you hit it on the head. And, and let me let me first thank you for your leadership within this space this sacred space of um, historically black colleges and universities uh, to be informed in making decisions is vitally important. And you, uh, Mr. Jared and HBCU Digest for years have been a credential, a, a critical and uh, vital source of information for this sector. So we appreciate you. Uh, and what you're doing that is so kind because so, so often i get the, the words you're a damn fool so that you just you just <laughs> you just really made my day you made my day with that one i appreciate okay. you brother <laughs> but but i but I, i'm serious about that okay and i, I appreciate you brother mm -hmm. so so i'm in a unique um role because not only do i have the opportunity to serve as president of clark atlanta university but i'm the chair of the Atlanta University Center Consortium, mm -hmm. of course, Morehouse, Spelman, Clark Atlanta University, and Morehouse School of Medicine. So as the chair, I had to be fair and balanced in, uh, and objective in these deliberations and considerations as to whether or not we should reopen on ground for the fall. Mm -hmm. So I had to do that uh, while taking into account all of my constituents from Clark Atlanta University, we conferred with faculty, staff, students, and alumni as to which direction we should go. The good news was, unequivocally, there was not just uni uh, um, consensus, but unanimity in the decision that for the health of our students, faculty, and staff, we should be fully online. There was also consensus, though, that the main consideration would be financial. And, and to be very honest, we will lose millions of dollars because of this decision. However, it was the right decision. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and Jared, when I think about this decision and, and being at the AUC where Martin Luther King walked those grounds, I think about what, what King said. He said, there comes a time when you must make the right decision because it's the right thing to do. He said that expediency, he said that, he said that uh, cowardice asked the question, is it safe? Expediency asked the question, is it politic? Mm -hmm. He went on, he went on, he went on to say that at the end of the day, conscience asked the question, though, is it right? right? And this was an opportunity where we just had to do the right thing. That, that's, that's what we did. That, so, and you hit it right on the head. I, I didn't mean to cut you off, brother. But th when you talk no. about the millions, that, that's something we have to underscore. And I think that the students and the parents have to hear that. Um, you know, that it's the position of the boards and the presidents like yourselves that Yes, we're doing this thing to maintain safety. Yes, it may be something you don't like. Yes, you may think, oh, I may want to go to another spot. But we hope that you will stick with us because at, when, at some point this is going to come to an end and we still need a customer base back in the fold, giving philanthropically students enrolling and, and pursuing degrees and changing the fortunes of their family. We still need communities to be behind us. That that That's correct. Like, And, and how much work do you have to do to let your constituent base know Stick with us, because <laughs> this thing ain't gonna last forever. That's right. 
and, and that's the good that's the thing about that's the unique thing jared about this brand mm -hmm. this brand as clark atlanta university and the other auc centers it's a, it's such a strong brand i think we had uh over nineteen thousand uh applications for admission for this incoming class mm -hmm. so the brand is so strong that we're in a a solid position um, that those students are going to come back. I mean, I'm just I just have no doubt about it. Now, some of our other um, HBCUs um, are may have more of a struggle, which is why I'm working with UNCF, Nafio, and Thurgood Marshall to get additional stimulus funds to help them because some of them may have uh, more challenges on the financial side than these AUC center schools have. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we have to let parents know. This is a decision that was that was difficult because we are going to lose millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars. And and but I, I have confidence that number one, there'll be additional stimulus funds coming down. And number two, that our alumni bases are going to respond with additional giving to, to, to support us. Let's talk about and I know this is this is a little bit uncomfortable um, and I hate to put you in a position, but I think it's relevant. Oh, Clark, no, no, no. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> it won't be too tough. I promise, brother. Okay. <laughs> so okay. Clark, okay. Clark Atlanta is is obviously in the center of of Atlanta. Um, and I asked Dr. Thomas about this and he was you know, he was honest. He said, yeah, I mean, maybe the politics doesn't touch us and push us directly. But politics is a part of how we consider this. Do you agree with that? The politics of reopening mask wearing, the legislation, you know, the lawsuits going around the state and the city. I know you see all of it. You're politically astute yourself and have been for a long time. How do the politics work into your conversations with your stakeholders? And do they how much do they matter because Clark is private and doesn't have that much resistance to the kind of plans it wants to make? Well, um, so so um, I'm, I'm chair of the SIC Council of Presidents mm -hmm. of football uh, sports conference. So I had to, in having the same conversation, the privates, we were like, we are going to make up our own minds whether or not we're going to have a football season. Mm -hmm. Some of my colleagues who were presidents of the state schools, however, were between a rock and a hard place. Yeah. Because they couldn't make that decision. When Governor Kemp says we're going to reopen the school system and we're going to have sports, it's just done. So politically, it really, like you said, it affected the state schools uh, more so than the privates. But it influences our decision because people from Arizona and California and Wyoming that come to Atlanta, they're looking at the politics. Right. And those people are concerned that Governor Kemp is is, is not as aggressive as uh, Mayor Lance Watkins is on safety measures and social distancing. Mm -hmm. So that actually affects our enrollment and those students who are willing to come or not come. But again, as you noted earlier, the good thing is we are private, so it's our decision whether we play football, whether we open, whether we close, whether we're hybrid. That's totally our uh, consideration. And I'm thankful, though, that on the politics side of it, on the federal level, that there was strong support from Congress in this CARES Act and additional stimulus money, which has really uh, helped all HBCUs in the nation tremendously. Do you think that it's fair that at least in the higher education industry, that black colleges really, really have taken the lead on saying we got to dial back fall sports? We got to think about online learning through the fall because we're not close to or at least at this point not close to a vaccine and these numbers are going up do you think that that is a an opportunity for hbcus or do you look at that as a burden for hbcus because we have to do what so many larger more well-resourced institutions won't do or can't do which is say you know what we're going to protect all students and more particularly black bodies who are suffering disproportionately from this virus I think that conferences like uh, SIEC and uh, MIAC uh, were were bold mm -hmm. in, in coming forth and saying, listen, we care more about our students and their health than we do about finances. Mm -hmm. Yes, 
it's, 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 it's going to take a hit on the activities for the fall, on alums returning to our campuses for homecoming and football games and, and making donations. We're, we're going to take a hit. But, but you can't social distance as between uh, someone tackling a man trying to get into the end zone, right. breathing in his face. You just cannot social distance that. Mm -hmm. So we're putting our athletes at risk. Now, we're Division Two. We're not making money off sports. We, so I, I fully understand the distinction as between the University of Alabama and Clark Atlanta University. University of Alabama, they can still have um, televised games with no one in the stadium and make tens of millions of dollars. Right. So I totally, I totally understand that. Um, so, so our opportunity as Division Two, though, is is quite different because we're not making money. Most HBCUs actually lose money. I just break even with football being the variable that allows them to just break even. So, so we're not we're not really losing um, income with this decision, and we're, and we're protecting our athletes and our students. And I ask you this this question specifically because you come from a, an entrepreneurial background. You did it with Miles when you were in Fairfield, and you thought a lot about economic development and workforce development in and around with a campus being the anchor for a way that a community right. can grow. That's not the same thing in Atlanta, so to speak, but you could say that it's the same thing for the West End in a lot of cases. Do you have to work with communities and the business community around the AUC when you make a decision like this to kind of brace them or to prepare them like, hey, you know that student traffic you're used to every fall? And every <laughs> that that won't be here. Um, is that so, is that a conversation you have to have before you do this, or you just got to do what the institution does, and you'll you will work with you know the municipal partners after it's done? Well, and and, and I have a great relationship with the business community here in Atlanta. As a matter of fact, Clark Atlanta University, we are the largest landowner in West End. Mm -hmm. uh, we are working on a one point one billion dollar. Uh, development, which is going to be a uh, mixed use private public partnership, is going to bring up our whole area. And let me say again, 1.1 billion. That's a huge project. Mm -hmm. So, so we have great relationships. So, formally, I don't confer with the business uh, leaders about decisions like this, but informally, I do. I get phone calls. I make phone calls. This is what's about to happen, and just kind of be braced for. It. So you're right, and it's important. Um, that we have those relationships. Now, that being said, we have to realize, though, that we're in the middle of a food desert. Mm -hmm. There are businesses that need to come into the West End that are not there now. So as far as businesses that will really be directly affected by our decision, there are honestly not many, not many, not many at all around us. And then the final question, man, and this is this is more on a personal note. Um, to to transition from Alabama to Georgia, and more specifically the 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 economic epicenter of the South, really, and yeah. to deal with this a historic global pandemic. Obviously, nobody saw it coming. Obviously, you take this with a you know a very optimistic view, and you, you couldn't have predicted it, but. Do you do you look at this as an opportunity for you and for your personal leadership story? Or do you say, my, you know what, my story, so to speak, is on pause. Not that you're pausing your work. You're still leading your institution in your community. But you're saying all my focus and all my love at this point is to keep these babies and these faculty and staff healthy. And then we'll get on with, you know, what I want to do with Clark Atlanta University. You know, you 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 are you are very perceptive. Um, <laughs> in, in you, you really are. You're very perceptive. I was on a senior leadership call with my team this morning, and I was thanking them for their leadership because we've been working around the clock, twenty four seven. And when I when I say around the clock, I mean we're on the phone at midnight often. Mm -hmm. We're on Saturdays and Sundays always, and I emphasize to them my appreciation for them because. Had I had to depend on, I, I have um, cabinet meetings uh, when we were on ground once a week, mm -hmm. 10 o'clock on Monday morning. Had I had just 10 o'clock Monday morning meetings once a week with this team, we would be nowhere near as close 
as we are, as dependent upon each other as we are, because we had to meet every day, day and night, all day. Mm. And now we're stronger as a team. So, so while it was a crisis and is a crisis, it was an opportunity for us to really jail. It was an opportunity, quite honestly, for them to depend on me and allow me to quarterback. Had this situation not happened, I'd still have leaders on campus determining whether or not they were going to support me and let me lead. Mm-hmm. But since it's a crisis, I did. And, and and this is the really the third. We had a, before I even arrived in Atlanta, in August, August 18th, there was a shooting um, in front of the library, not on our campus, but in front of the library right there by our campus. Mm-hmm. So I had to quarterback that from Birmingham. Then I arrived and we had the tragedy of Alexis Crawford, one of my precious students that was murdered. And I actually performed her eulogy, ministered to the family, and ministered to the campus. So they depended upon me right away for that leadership. So, so these crises, uh, Jared, had caused the campus community to allow me to quarterback, to do what it is that I do, <laughs> that I love, which is the quarterback and orchestrate. Uh, because I've got a great team here, but no matter how great your team is anywhere, if they don't succumb and willingly support your leadership, it does not matter. So this crisis has allowed them to 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 view and support my leadership and my compassion for my community and my university.